Yeah, so this is the last presentation of this tutorial. And um, uh, the idea is I will just I will uh, begin and then uh, going through the challenges that we are trying to address together here, um, both in Marvel and Max and also you guys. Um, so the, the first one is um, the high throughput challenge. And we have just heard a great talk about uh, what a challenge <laughs> this actually is. So I'm not going to spend more time on this. Uh, of course, uh, our way of trying to address this challenge is AIDA. Um, the second challenge is reproducibility. So, and reproducibility starts uh, with yourself. So can you redo a calculation that you did two years ago? Uh, can, then, it's, then it goes to your group, right? So can your office mate reproduce the calculation that you did last week? And uh, yeah, so um, the idea is uh, that uh, by keeping track of how we do things automatically in AIDA, uh, we simplify the task of, I mean, we, simply, we, we essentially make it possible to store all of this information for a long period of time. Uh, and again, AIDA yeah, is, is our tool for dealing with the reproducibility problem. However, then um, there's also if we can move the slide, does it, is it? I think it doesn't work. Uh, um, there's also open data. This is essentially the reproducibility extended uh, to the whole scientific community, right? So, and here is it's not not anymore enough to have somehow all the data uh, there that uh, actually is needed to reproduce everything. It also needs to be made available in some form that other people can, in principle, at least figure out what is going on, uh, and if possible, also make it easy to do that. And this is a, this is a tough challenge. And that is the reason people, not many people are doing this is not because people don't want to do this. I think we all want this. But the problem is that it's a lot of work. And so here, uh, Materials Cloud comes into the picture, and Giovanni is going to talk about this. Uh, for the next few minutes. Um, and the last challenge I'm going to mention is uh, knowledge transfer. Um, this is another uh, aspect of Materials Cloud that Sasha has already introduced. So here I'm thinking of sharing a workflow for your code with a collaborator or a company, right? So how do you do that? And how do you not only share like, maybe a code of a workflow, but share the environment needed to run the workflow as well? Um, so that is uh, the AIDA lab. This is a component of uh, Materials Cloud. And I, I now hand over to Giovanni to introduce it to you. Thank you. OK, so I'll try to be brief, uh, just to give you a bit of an overview of what Materials Cloud is and what it can do. So the first thing I like to say typically is uh, if you think to AIDA like Git, you all know Git. So Git is a tool to keep track of the history of your source code and the modifications. AIDA is a tool in a sense to keep track of the history of your data and how it was produced. In this analogy, Materials Cloud plays a bit of the role of GitHub. Uh, so where you can really push your data, share it with collaborators, visualize it, visualize it, inspect the, the history. The, and you already did this the fir very first day with the explore section to visualize your own data in your, your own database. But actually, uh, Materials Cloud is also a bit more, and I will show you a bit of things uh, uh, in, a, in the next few slides. In particular, there are five sections, which uh, is, I try to target five different things we do as researchers. So we start by learning about the material, then we want to work, so produce research, uh, produce simulations and data, then understand new things uh, by, creating, by looking and creating curated data sets. But then we want to maybe also look into the raw data as generated by either the provenance and make it be able to reproduce it. We want to archive it, get DOIs, publish it. And then when we do this, this actually is a kind of a loop because we, other researchers or ourselves can start from the published data, start learning again, and redo the same loop with a new research project. Um, so the, very briefly, I want to give you an overview of what these sections are. Um, to, in order to, to be a bit faster, I will just show some slides. But if you go online on the Materials Cloud website, you, you see this. 
So the, the first one is called Learn. There's a number of uh, educational material, in particular videos. They are so both on codes on different schools on Quantum Espresso, uh, other codes, Vanilla 90, it was a school in uh, ICTP last year, but also advanced tutorials, videos of lectures and distinguished lectures from Marvel in particular. And the nice thing, there is a technology which allows us to share both the video of the speaker and the video of the slides, and you can easily scroll and jump to the right place. And you're using this, this now, also we're recording the videos now, so we might have also these videos in the same technology. Then the second part, as I said, is work. Work for us means uh, the place where we can generate new data. So these two sections you already saw very extensively, so I won't spend too many words on this. So ID Lab, you saw yesterday, is a place where you can put your, you, have a kind of, you can run things on the cloud via AIDA, and your, your own space. And then you also heard already about the quantum mobile, so a virtual machine in which you already have the codes pre-installed and pre-configured. So there is all the simulation codes, we have, we have a number of them, plus AIDA. And it contains also the AIDA lab, so you want to use it, probably yesterday you saw this, if you want to deploy something or develop something for the AIDA lab or just use it, you can do it also inside the quantum mobile. And we really want to stress this, so two things here. One is very good for education. Actually, what you used on the Amazon machines actually was the quantum mobile deployed there. So I think it's very efficient at the beginning if you have a short course to give something which works from day one and then people can just learn the code more than learning how to install it and then you can focus on learning how to install it later. So if you want to deliver a course in university, take it into account. The other thing I want to stress is very modular, as we already said yesterday by Sasha, but anyway, it's very modular, you can remove pieces, you can install your own pieces, it's fully automated, there are scripts to automate it. And if you want to have a new code, contact us, we can help you explain you how to add a new code to the quantum mobile. It's very easy. It has a few files to prepare to say how to compile the code, how to, where to put it, etc. The other thing I wanted to mention uh, is tools. So while AIDA Lab is focused on having your own space, your own files, and running longer simulation with AIDA, tools are more as, as more a section dedicated to have sh small tools that where you want to have some visualization of the results. Uh, but where the actual simulation, if you want, or calculation runs in a few seconds or fractions of a second. Um, there are already a few available. Uh, there are five, actually. Uh, I will show very screenshots of two of them, but just to mention what they are. So Sigprof is a tool that actually uses directly in the tutorial, not from the web, but from the, uh, the Python interface, to generate, um, to, to actually uses SPGlib behind the hoods to get the symmetry. Of the, of the material. Actually, let me say, I mean, Togo Atsushi, who's here, is actually the author of SPGLib, since I think everybody uses SPGLib, I think it's good to, <laughs> to mention him. And then SIGPAF so standardizes the cell in this way and then calculates the path in the brilliant zone that you can use for your band structure. So for, you just give a structure and we give you the, the complete path to compute the band structure. There are two tools developed in the group of Professor Ceriotti, actually do machine learning on properties of materials. So they did a lot of TFT calculations. They pre prepared a, a, a machine learning model and then can predict both uh, the chemical shifts in materials and uh, the molecular, molecular polarizabilities of, of mo molecules and crystals by you just put the materials there and it takes roughly 30 seconds and then you can get uh, these properties for your materials if they contain only uh, H, C, N, and O. Uh, there is an interactive visualizer, actually, exactly the same one as was said by Enrique, that was done by Enrique Miranda, uh, the same one was presented before. So actually Enrique did all the front-end part, the visualization. Uh, then we embedded it in our, uh, in our infrastructure for making tools, which, makes, which means that basically we also have a backend now, so you can, it's not only in the, in the browser, so we can add new functionality, like we can upload files and convert the format in the backend and uh, uh, provide uh, the visualization also for more complex data formats and for and potentially in the future for more, co for more uh, uh, codes. For now we can uh, support the native JSON format of the visualizer plus the quantum espresso format. And then there is a nice uh, other tool here which is a basically uh, a way to help experimentalists find the right synthesis conditions for, uh, in this case for metal organic frameworks by using machine learning and genetic algorithms. So the idea is they prepare a few experimental conditions, they put them there, and then the, 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 the tool will tell them, look, try now with these other five conditions. They do the experiment, they put a new data, and the tool will tell them, okay, try, 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 and in order to minimize the number of experiments they have to do. 
So very briefly to see how they look like, for instance, for SIGPATH, uh, well, you have a typical interface where you can either upload a file yourself. There are a number of potential formats you can upload. And, or you can choose an example, so you can also use it for, again, for educational purposes. You want to see, for instance, what's the Brillo end zone of um, I don't know, FCC material, so you up choose a material or you upload it. And you see this is really a 3D visualizer. You can drag and drop, uh, and sorry, just rotate it. You see the full path. You see the, the primitive structure here, so it uses the, as I said, SPGlib to find the primitive structure. It provides the coordinates both in... Uh, uh, scaled units and, in, and uh, Cartesian units of the of the K points and suggest as a path. And actually, if you go below, you also have uh, templates <coughs> of input files. So if you want to use uh, CP2K or Quantum Espresso, you can really copy paste the coordinates in the format the code wants. <coughs> and the other one I was mentioning is again this, this is the other tool. This is the phono visualizer, as I said. And the way it looks is the colors are a bit different, but I mean it's the same. Uh, Enrique did it was a bit adapted by us. To, for, for a number of stylistic things. But as I said, actually, also there you have a, a, an upload page which looks like, it looks very similar to the one of SIGPA where you have other examples or you can upload your own files. Um, so these are work, so we said learn, videos, work, new simulations either in the, in the IDA Lab and Quantum Mobile or um, with tools. And then there are the three additional sections which are really the part about data sharing in a fair way. So fair, uh, you, know, you have already heard, it means uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and uh, reusable. And so the first one I mentioned is the archive. So the archive is a repository where you can upload your data. This is open to everybody. I will mention also maybe later some uh, how it works. Um, you get a DOI for your data. Yes, typical metadata, so authors, abstract. Uh, uh, it's uh, indexed in a number of uh, registries, and it's also actually recommended by scientific data. So if you want to publish on scientific data, and then you want to have your data uh, available, if you put it on the Materials Cloud Archive, uh, they're okay. They suggest this as a repository for material science. The interesting thing, though, besides the files, I don't show here, there are files you can download. So, you, for instance, you can upload your AIDA uh, database. So if you use AIDA for your research, you can just put it there, you export your old database, and you uh, put it as a file to download, and other people can use it. But if you do this, and if you do your research with AIDA, you can also activate uh, links to the other two sections, Discover and Explore. So the Discover <coughs> is a section about curated data. So data that you thought about and you, and you want to present in an easy way to understand. <coughs> it's basically the process you do after you do your simulations and you want to prepare the figures for your scientific paper. <coughs> in this case, for instance, for uh, the example I was showing before, the 2D materials, uh, we have chosen to have a way to select the materials, so we have a periodic table or we have a table, a list. And then for every material, you have a page with the interactive visualization of the band structure, or the phonon band structure of, of the material, and a number of computed properties here. And that's, this makes it easy for people to go there and say, okay, there is a project on 2D materials, I want to know if this material is 2D and what are the properties. I go here and it's into, if you know a bit of the, what this project is about, I mean, of the physics or the material science, you understand this. But then the interesting thing is that you have all these little AIDA icons, and if you click on them, you jump on the Explore section, What actually, you don't need to spend much because you already saw it, how it works, but I just let the video run in the meantime. So <coughs> you, you, you click here, you see this node again, but then you can use the interface you used also uh, a few days ago to browse the provenance, so you see for this specific project how this band structure was computed. This was done with AIDA, so you have all the provenance, this quantum espresso, so you recognize you have the raw inputs, raw outputs, it's the interface that you have already used uh, a few days ago. And so for us, this combination of these three sections, archive, explore, and discover, really make AIDA, a fair, uh, AIDA and Materials Cloud together uh, a, a what we call an open science platform, which is fair compliance. Because it's findable, because by putting things on the archive, there you have DOIs, so it's, you can cite them, and we guarantee thanks also to the partnership with CSCS, that this data is going to stay there for at least 10 years after the, you put it there. So even if our funding goes away, we are, have a, an agreement where we pay upfront for the next 10 years for the storage of this data. It's accessible because you have this web interface, you have the discover section, which makes it easy to go there. And then you can visualize the structures, you can visualize the data and the provenance. It's interoperable because being run with AIDA, if you run a project with AIDA, you have these data structures and you saw how we already structured the input 
in units which are reusable, like crystal structures or structured data, uh, parameters, k points. All these things can be reused between different codes. Uh, and finally, it's reusable because on one side, okay, there are open, you can decide the license you want. We suggest open licenses so other people can take the data and reuse it. But also, you have the full provenance, so it's not only reusable, but it's really reproducible. And to help you also take care of what now most, if not all, funding agencies require, which is a data management plan, we start now providing templates of data management plans. So if one of you wants to apply for a project and the data management plan is required, uh, I think the fact of you using AIDA and or the materials cloud is very powerful because you can say how you deal with the data. Uh, for those of you who would know, that management plan is basically a document where you state how you are going to take care of the data during the project. So if you store them in servers, in the supercomputer, if you do backups, but also really in which formats you store them, how you keep track of the reproducibility problems, and after the research, how you're going to publish. When you do a scientific publication, how you do publish the research, who guarantees that this data is going to be there in the future. And so we have templates, for instance, if you just put things on the materials cloud, uh, on, on the archive without using AIDA, or if you also use AIDA, we have some kind of sentences that you can take and reuse. This is for the template for the Swiss National Science Foundation, but the content is going to be the same, and we're going to provide more for the European projects, etc. But the good thing, is, is, uh, we already mentioned, I think, a couple of days ago, is that by doing open science, you will really ac accelerate the research in a sense, because for the research I was showing you before, for this archive and discovery section, this uh, 2D project we, we did, we did the research because we were interested in having a database of 2D materials. And we put it on a materials cloud because we were interested in sharing these results with the provenance. And this group in uh, both in Cineca and University of Bologna, they took the data and they estimated um, the time it takes to do a one uh, SCF cycle and they have a number of models, some analytical and some machine learning, and they're going to present this uh, in a couple of weeks in PASC. So this, again, is very powerful, I think, as an, an example where you do some research, and by just publishing it, you allow other people to do things you didn't even think about at the beginning. And this actually, is, as we discussed, is very useful also for us in the end. It's kind of, a, again, a cycle, because when we, with this model will be available, we can use it to automatically optimize, the, 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 for instance, the how to parallelize a code on a, on a, on a cluster. So a couple of uh, questions and answers about the archive. So um, in case you want to contribute, so you have a paper, you did some research, even without AIDA, and you want to publish the data there so it's available. Um, you can upload, if you're not part of the project funding this, uh, five gigabytes for, for a single project. So if you have a <laughs> few gigabyte file, you can put it there. If you use AIDA, I kind of to encourage using our AIDA and put in database there. So if you did a research with AIDA and you want to publish the, the database, we can al allow for free up to 50 gigabytes per project. Um, and we, as I said, we guarantee that it's going to be there for at least 10 years. The records are frozen in a sense, so we want to guarantee also that you don't this thing doesn't disappear. So we have to put some rules. So as many of these repositories do, once you publish it, it's published. It's there. The only thing you can change, like on the archive with the, ex the preprint server, you can just change the references because at the bottom you have references to your scientific paper. So people go in here, they see on which scientific paper you published the results. For all the rest, you can make new versions. So you have a history of versions and you upload the new files and you have a version two, version three, et cetera, and they are, they are linked. Um, there are some policies about what we do. This, we, at the moment, we, we have a moderation phase, which is mainly a moderation on the the topic, so we only accept at the moment uh, mater computational material science uh, and on the file format. So a typical thing that happens, and I think it's a very good, I mean, it takes quite some effort as a cost, a human and uh, economical cost to do this moderation, because for every entry we get, we have a few of us, and now it's me and, and Leopold, we check the entries. But it's very important, I think, because we do basic checks like, uh, did you put a readme for the file? So if someone goes there, and does the person understand what it's trying to download. Does the format of the files you use, uh, is a standard format or is a very strange format that nobody can open? Uh, you know, did you forget to put some keywords to allow people for searching? Th these kind of very simple things and typically, you know, in one iteration people improve their data. I think it's very good because uh, if, what I, mean, I would say that up to now, more than half of the, of the entries went through uh, one email exchange. Uh, so it's not, 
two two months of exchanges, just a few days. And uh, but the entries now are much better, I would say. So very briefly, the, the, the platform. Uh, I don't want to bore you with this, but they say there is AIDA behind the hood, for the, especially for the explorer part, as you saw. But then there is a quite a few backend components that make all these parts work together. There is a part for the archive, which takes care of storing the data and giving the DOIs. There is a part for the video sharing. There is all the parts for the AIDA lab, etc. And then you have the, all the JavaScript front end that we have developed. Um, the platform itself is running at CSCS, at the Swiss Supercomputer Center, and there are a number of uh, virtual machines of the order of 20, because everything is duplicated in development. Uh, and the data is stored either on the machines themselves or, or on the object storage, but that's a bit more technical. So um, I let, let uh, now Leo just conclude with a few final, final slides, also with some suggestions for the, not really on materials cloud, but more for the future, let's say, on, on how to continue to continue to collaborate. Yeah, so the, uh, the Materials Cloud Archive uh, started really as a practical, uh, simple solution to a, to a problem, right? Um, and uh, in order to be able to scale really to large numbers of submissions, uh, one thing that is definitely uh, in the uh, plan for the next few months is uh, we're going to transition to uh, NVENU 3. It's a Python framework used also by Zenodo. Um, so uh, Zenodo is a research uh, data repository operated by CERN. They have millions of uh, data records, uh, and uh, so we we visited them. They know what they're doing, and we are going to move the archive to this framework, uh, which also then brings a uh, lots of nice features, so user management, uh, search, serialization, etc. Um, uh, another big upcoming thing is, uh, as uh, Sasha mentioned, the scalable AIDA lab. So. Uh, we have already AIDA Lab running on a Kubernetes. We're now in the process of contacting the different agencies, so CSCS, uh, the EOSC hub, um, to deploy it there so that we can have instances that really support large numbers of users. Um, on the other hand, if you are interested in hosting an AIDA Lab on your institution, uh, can be also very small, can be like one virtual machine, uh, over the next few months, contact us because... Uh, the idea of the AIDA lab is not that there will be one in the whole world, um, but uh, you can operate it in your institute, you can operate it in your company, so we, they will also, we will also collaborate with some companies who want, to, want this. Um, so ju just let us know.